Very humbling. <laughs> humbling and fun. Praise God. I used to be the loudest person in the house. I'm not any longer, so she is now the she is now the loudest. <laughs> she got those supersonic windpipes, man. Let's turn to Joshua chapter one, please. And obviously, I'm going to turn the. Um, I'm not going to preach the full time I normally preach. I will uh, condense it. And just give you a word. How many of you have already been ministered to tremendously, right? Golly, man. God really showed up strong in worship. Thank you to everybody that shared. And golly, man, the worship time was just amazing. So thankful. Praise the Lord. It really was, man. Um, Joshua chapter 1. And, um, you know, we, we live in a unique time. We live in an exciting time. Um, I think that we can all just sense the excitement that's in the atmosphere right now spiritually. Um, you know, the darkness has been intense for quite some time, but there's been a shift and uh, there's an excitement and um, of, of good things happening and good things to come. And um, I feel it real strong. I, don't, I think I'm, I'm probably more excited about God and his kingdom and what's happening in the earth than I've ever been in my entire life. And um, uh, things are changing and uh, God's pouring out his spirit. And so um, it's really time to, to be um, prepared uh, to operate in what God has called you to do. And in order to do that, in the time that we're living in, you're going to need boldness. Um, you're going to need confidence. And, uh, you know, boldness and confidence is not something that's just born of the personality. It's not something that God just gives some people and some people don't have it. There is a, a spiritual place of boldness and confidence that comes out of your spirit and will we'll strengthen you and empower you uh, to live your life without fear and to, to boldly come forward and possess what's yours. You know, when we were having communion earlier, everybody in this room, you understand that you have a right to take that and to possess that. You know, I don't think anybody in here felt as if they were not worthy or uh, that, you know, it wasn't something that was necessarily open to them. And so there was a boldness that come upon you to take what's yours. And um, there is a boldness that, that comes upon us in order for us to possess the land, to possess what the Lord has given to us. And, uh, you know, in the days of the children of Israel, this land was a geographical location. It was a place. Um, how many know the promised land is no longer a geographical location or a place? How many know the promised land is where you stand? It's where you stand. That is your promised land. Um, and, and ultimately where you stand is in the son of God, talking about Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, um, Jesus is your promised land. And what Jesus provides for you is that all his promises are yes and amen to you. Uh, there's not a single promise in the Bible that's not yours. And how many know in the days ahead, you're going to need something stronger than your own strength to help you to overcome. And that's why it says he's given unto you exceeding great and precious promises that by these you may escape the corruption that's in the world uh, through lust. And so there is a corruption that's in the world. There's darkness that's in the world. But how I many know oh, God wants us to, to overcome and to possess and to take what's ours? And then in the book of Joshua, um, the children of Israel are being prepared to go in and possess the land. And the word of the Lord to Joshua and to the people has a lot to do with courage and boldness. Uh, because they were they were they were going to a land that still had giants in it. How I many everybody in here? You still got some giants. <laughs> everybody here, there's still giants that you're dealing with, right? You got some giant heads in your pocket. You've overcame. You've got some victories. You've got some testimonies. But then there's also some giants that are still there in the land. And I would say in our lives personally, but also corporately as well. How I many know there's giants in the land of America? There's giants in the land of the Lord. There's wars. There's rumors of wars. There's the cost of eggs, there's, you know, politicians and politics and secrets and, and uh, you know, balloons in the sky and, you know, the, the list goes on and on and on of the craziness of the times that we're living in. And so there are some corporate giants that I think that we're dealing with. And there's also personal giants. But how I many of you know there's never been a giant that was too strong for God? And so if there's never been a giant that's too strong for God, that means there's never been a giant that's too strong for you because God lives on the inside of you. But God wants to remind us that he lives on the inside of us so that we'll have courage and we'll have strength to stand against the giants 
and see those giants fall rather than living in a place of subservience and fearfulness and anxiety and nervousness. I mean, God's not giving you a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound, disciplined mind. Amen? You're not called to walk in fear or live in fear. You're called to walk in boldness. And so there's a boldness that God's given to us. Let me read you this passage of Scripture. Joshua 1.5, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. This is God's words to Joshua. How many of Joshua's name is Yeshua? And how many of Yeshua is Jesus' name? So this is not just a, a word to an individual in the Old Testament. I mean, oh, this is a word to the Lord Jesus Christ who's about to take his people into the promised land. And if it's a word for him, I mean, oh, it's a word to you because you are in him. Right? It says, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I so, I so I will be with you also. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of a, gir- a good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. I mean, you know, this is a theme, right? Be strong, be courageous. That you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. I mean, you know, Joshua did not have the luxury of being spirit-led. He had to be law-led. And so God's like, if I'm going to lead you through the promised land, I need you to obey the laws because that's the roadmap that you've been given. I mean, you know, now you have a greater roadmap. Praise God, aren't we glad we don't have to deal with maps anymore? Amen. Folks, if I had to get where I was going with the map as a traveling minister, I would never minister to anybody because I would stay lost. God knew my ministry could not begin until we had GPS. Because without GPS, I can't even get to Walmart. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so the map was good, but how many know the GPS is better? Can I get an amen? Amen. Because when you miss your turn, the GPS will reroute you and take you to the place that you're supposed to go. I mean, the Holy Spirit's on the inside of you to be your GPS. Not only will he lead you down the pathways of the fulfillment of the law. I mean, love fulfills the law. Right? God's not going to lead you something contrary to love. But he'll take, he'll take you into a place of greater detail and greater leading. Because the Spirit of God can speak to you to share your testimony. The Spirit of God can speak to you... Uh, to, to, you know, what, what God spoke to me this morning as I got in the shower. How many of the Spirit of God is speaking all the time? Yeah. And so a part of stepping into this promised land is listening to that Holy Spirit GPS and doing what God tells you to do. Can I get an amen? Um, and then he goes on, he says, Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left hand, that you may prosper wherever you go. So there's a promise to prosper. There's a promise to overcome. You're going into a land that has giants that has darkness, but there's a promise that you're going to overcome. How are you going to overcome? You do what God tells you to do. Very simple, right? And how many know in order to do what God tells you to do, you have to listen for direction. And you have to be willing to be led. And you can't be wise in your own eyes. If you're wise in your own eyes, you won't listen to God. You'll follow your own will. Right? And so the the place of humility and the place of being corrected and looking for the Lord's direction is actually the place of safety and prosperity in the days ahead. Because if we can all just do what God's telling us to do, we can get past the storm, we can get over the storm, we can slay the giant and give the Lord credit. Can I get an amen? Right? And so it says, um, But you shall observe to do according to all that is written, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then will you have good success. And so once again, he's saying your success is in listening to me, your success is in doing what I tell you to do. You know, I've arrived to a place in my life where I'm going to do whatever God tells me to do. I didn't get this far following my own will or doing my own thing. Now, all you know, certainly I make my own small decisions. You know, how many, how many cupcakes I'm going to eat, how many milkshakes I'm going to drink. You know what I'm saying? Like, I take my own liberty in my private life. But in my big decisions, I'm going to do what God tells me to do no matter what that is because he's smarter than me and I want to follow his will and not my own. Can I get an amen to that? That attitude is the, is the recipe for success in the days ahead. And he says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and of a good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I mean, you know, all we need to know is God's with us. As long as I know the Lord's with me, I'm cool. And that's what he ends the passage with saying. He said, I'm with you when you listen to me and when you don't. He said, I'm not going to leave you nor forsake you. As he's telling you to follow him, he never says, if you don't, I'm not going with you. Isn't that fantastic? He said, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. How many of Moses didn't always listen to God? 
How many of y'all Moses killed somebody? Right? And ran for 40 years from the call of God in his life. You know who didn't run? God. God was right there with Moses during his times of silence and disobedience and even fear. God said, you may give up on you, but I'm not going to give up on you. Because I don't give up on those that I call. I mean, you are the called ones. Can I get an amen? You, you, have, you have been chosen by God to know him. And so, even if you fail, God's not going to fail you. And how many know that brings a sense of peace? Because then we go back to the gospel, we go back to the faithfulness of the Lord, right? Now turn to Proverbs 28, please. And I love this subject of boldness. Um, it's always been something that's been near and dear to my heart. Because I've always felt like it was going to take a special type of boldness to really change the world. Um, that it was going to take something uh, special and, and maybe greater than what we're currently operating in. How I many you know that the world is trying to push Christians and relegate them to the back corner of the back room of society? And say, you know, just say, these are the backward hicks, these are the idiots, these are those that actually believe in God. And uh, there's a real pressure... Um, from cancel culture uh, to, to lay down your cross and to close your Bible and to go move into a post-modern Christianity. And that was nice. That was fables. That was for children. But we're progressively growing beyond that, right? That's what they're offering. Hallelujah. The beauty of it all is, is how many you know you reach a stage in your life, at least I have, where... I do not care at all what any of those people think about me. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And um, I don't, I, I mean, one of the greatest freedoms you can have is getting free from people. Get free from what people think, man. Because, like, sometimes people are going to be cool, sometimes they're not. Sometimes you're going to be cool, sometimes you're not. <laughs> And man, the more free we get from the whole concept of trying to please people and get them to like us and all those types of things, how many other gospels set you free from that? Because the gospel will offend good people. Hallelujah. Darkness is already offended, you know. They're already trying to cancel you. But when the gospel, you know, those that dip, dip bread, dip in you with the bread, your brother... Your people near you will, will, will uh, you know, come against you. And how many of that's more painful than a stranger on the streets, right? And so you've endured enough rejection to where it, it shouldn't bother you as bad as it used to in the days of your youth. <laughs> that's an encouragement, right? It is. And so um, there's a boldness that arises out of that to where you don't have to be concerned about rocking the boat because you were created to rock the boat. You weren't created to ride in the boat. You are created to rock the boat. Amen? God's rocking the boat right now. And uh, I want to rock where God rocks in the boat. Amen? And um, to me, that's exciting. You know, how many of Jesus uh, rocked the temple tables? <laughs> and he cast them out. You know, he, he tossed them. He upended them. He changed the, the structure of the way that they were fellowshipping with God. And how many of God's doing the same thing in the day and age we're living? Y'all ready for something new? Y'all yeah. ready for something different? Yeah. I don't got the full pattern on it yet, but I know it's coming. Yeah. And I'm excited about it, you know, and I'm ready to do whatever it looks like, whatever he wants. You know what I'm saying? Services might not look like this in the days ahead and in the future. Might not be a monologue. Might not be one person doing all the talking. Might be everybody coming together and sharing. One has a psalm. One has a hymn. One has a word. First Corinthians, right? Liberty and freedom in God's house, man. The moving of the Spirit. God being the orchestrator of such things. Amen? But, you know, in order to operate in that, there's a level of boldness that God wants you to step into. God doesn't want you drawn back. God doesn't want you feeling intimidated by somebody else. I mean, there's nobody in this room that's any better than anybody else right now. Can I get an amen? amen? I mean, there's no one in this room that's more right with God than anybody else. Can I get an amen? There's no one in this room more anointed than anyone else. Can I get an amen? amen? We are anointed by God. And so a part of us stepping into this place of freedom is removing these boundaries of insecurities that we, we have uh, uh, lived in ourselves, right? And hopefully in the, the past, you know, four or five years as the hammer of the gospel just comes down in your heart and your mind, you're going to wake up to the fact that your sin is not greater than God's grace. 
So just let the grace of God flow. Let God do what he's going to do. Let God use you mightily in your flawed earthen vessel so that the power may be of God and not of man. Can I get an amen? amen. Hallelujah. So don't disqualify yourself from flowing in, in God's places of freedom and, and, in, and, in, and in ministry, right? And so there's a boldness that God wants to bring over our lives so that we can step into these things and we can live uh, in this place of, of just community and helping each other and loving each other. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1, it says, The wicked flees when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. How I many you know that your righteousness, when understood, should afford you some level of confidence and boldness? And I, and I promise you, if you really get a hold of that, um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a progressively revealed revelation. Um, it's not something that you get the first time you've heard it. Um, as you hear the message of the gospel, the intention of it is to make you skilled in righteousness so that you'll stop putting your confidence on external things like the way you look, how much money you have, how much education you have. Um, any way that you can measure yourself against somebody else to determine your own worth, God wants to remove your ability to measure yourself out of your hands so that you would only measure yourself by himself. That you would measure yourself by the righteousness of God that's been given to you as a gift. And so you would not put your confidence in anything that you can do, but in what he has done. And when you start to do that, you start to fill up the, the, the nooks and the cracks in your own confidence. And, and, and all of a sudden, a boldness will arise upon your life. A confidence will arise upon your life. It's not based upon you, but it's based upon him. But it's important to keep getting the reality of the fact that you're right with God revealed to you because as you get solid in that it gets established in your life the intention is that you would just grow in confidence right now but if you have time periods where you're staring at your own righteousness how I many you know man's righteousness is as filthy rags if you spend your days staring at your righteousness you'll lose you'll lose confidence and boldness because you'll start to disqualify yourself and um, the reason that Jesus is our promised land is in him all the promises are what? So it's actually not based upon you at all. You and I have been removed as the weak link in the equation, right? And so the more we can get our eyes off of us and get our eyes onto Jesus and get established in this righteousness, there's a boldness that comes into our life. Amen. I mean, you know, if you know that God if you know that God is with you, you're confident. This promise is that God is with you, not according to your perfection but according to what he did on the cross and his heart towards you. Can I get an amen? Right? It's the gospel. It's the best news in the world. So the righteousness is arising and we're awakening to it. But now turn to Acts chapter 4. And I want to show you, I mean, you know, if you spend time around somebody, you start, to, you start to pick up their characteristics. For example, this morning I hugged Sean. If you've hugged Sean, Sean smells quite fragrant. And... And, and as I hugged him, I realized I have smelled this before. What is this? And I'm thinking, essential oils, right? He's wearing some essential oils. He's wearing um, thieves, right? And we were jokingly talking about how uh, that's a prophetic word because we've come to rob graves today, right? <laughs> and so I hugged him. And then how many of you know I smelled like him after I hugged him? And then I hugged John, who had on essential oils. And he had on lavender. And then I just got sweeter and sweeter as the day went on, right? <laughs> all these brothers smell. Then I hugged Tim and he smelled like manure and it all came back down. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, that's, that's my welcome back joke, man. Tim loves when I use poop as an analogy. <laughs> but as I spent time around these people... I began to pick up something about them that they had, and it became a part of my characteristics as well. Do you think that spending time around Jesus may have had any impact upon the way the disciples carried themselves? Acts chapter 4, verse 13, it says, When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished, and they recognized and realized that they had been with Jesus. So being around Jesus brought about a sense of confidence and boldness in these two individuals that was not based upon their education. It was not based upon their class. It was not based upon anything external. In fact, these were unlearned, uneducated, common men. But when they walked, they walked as kings. 
They walked as princes of the earth. They didn't walk like common fishermen. How many know that time around Jesus had transcended their concept of who they were? They no longer identified with just their trade. They identified with the fact that they were a part of the kingdom of God. And they had left their old identity to the past. So when they walked, they weren't intimidated by the Pharisees. How many of the Pharisees were used to intimidating people? And yet these common fishermen walk around like they're experts on God. And so they took knowledge. They said, well, clearly these are uneducated, unlearned men, but they have been with Jesus because of their boldness. Amen? And so God wants to bring a boldness onto your life. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 4. And He wants that boldness to help people understand that you're a believer. How I many know, as a whole, Christians have not been defined by their boldness? All the things that Scripture says we should be defined by, we're really quite deficit in. Let me just give you some examples of things that Christians are to be known by. Their love for one another. <laughs> um, their boldness. Their love and their boldness. And there's more. Their freedom. I mean, we're, we're actually supposed to be the most free people in the room. The Bible says that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Church services shouldn't be defined by boring bondage. It should be defined by freedom. There should be laughter. There should be singing. There should be joy in the house of God. Amen? Freedom, love, boldness. I mean, oh, that has not been the church at large. We've been hateful, scared, and in bondage. <laughs> Praise God. Sounds like a new church name. <laughs> hateful, bondage, oppressed. <laughs> First church with a hateful, bondage, and oppressed. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I feel like I should have done that joke better justice, but I was, I was scraping for straws there. I was trying to be funny. I mean, we can laugh about it or we can cry about it, right? But how many know God is He's changing that? And, um, you know, just like Jerry sharing in his testimony today, talking about walking in love towards your enemies. How I many know we don't have this kind of love that's like everybody else's love? We have a supernatural love. And the expression of that love is not just towards people we like, it's towards our enemies. Can I get an amen? I mean, I was aware for some folks in here today because we've all been through some challenges, man. And, uh, man, when you love your enemy, you don't just set them up for being ministered to. You also set yourself free from the slavery of being offended at their actions and their behaviors. Can I get an oh me? <laughs> Not an amen, an oh me. So, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, it says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. How many know that as you begin to understand the grace of God, there's a boldness that can come on your life. Because like when I know that I'm forgiven and when I know that everything from God is free and I don't qualify myself to receive these things, Jesus did and his blood did. I mean, you know, I, I then become someone who's ready to sit down at the father's table and dine on his promises because I know that I'm welcome. So I come boldly to the throne of grace. I don't come miserly. I don't come like I don't belong to be there. I don't come like any of those things. I walk up in the place like I own it, and I eat what is my dad's. Do y'all catch a glimpse of what that might look like? I mean, oh, that looks a little different than what we've currently seen. All creation groans and travails waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. The glorious liberty, the freedom, Right? Man, and so when you start to understand the grace of God, there's a boldness that comes on your life to where you're ready to take what's yours, right? How I many of you don't have to earn any of the promises of God? Can I get an amen? You have to earn one single promise. Nothing from God is for sale. It's all for free. You don't buy the anointing. You don't buy the giftings. You don't buy anything from God. Now, support ministries. Bless ministries. Bless people who bless you, but don't ever think that you're buying something from God because that's the most insulting thing to the blood of Jesus on earth. There's nothing in the kingdom that's for sale because it's too expensive. Can I get an amen? That's why Jesus was so mad at the money changers. That's why he drove them out of the temple. He said, you're selling stuff that's free. You've turned this place into a den of thieves. It's supposed to be a place of relationship and prayer. Jesus went off on them twice. Praise God. Amen. You don't buy stuff from God. It's free. Amen? 
Now, we'll go to one final place. I got like five minutes. And we'll go to 1 John chapter 4, and we'll, we'll close out right here in this last concept. <clears throat> got to be flexible, man. Got to be ready to, to make changes and do things differently. Praise God. And, and do what we feel led to do. And I also have some people I want to pray for, you know, before we, before we close out. There's some people who've already mentioned that they want prayer, and we want an opportunity to pray. And uh, just to agree with our brothers and sisters in the Lord and, and uh, to have the strength that that provides. But in 1 John chapter 4, and uh, this is the final point I want to make on God bringing forth a boldness in our life. 1 John chapter 4 verse 17, it says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. So it, it gives us a key. That word perfected is word teleos. And it doesn't mean perfect in our modern vernacular. It means mature or completed. And so um, love has been matured or completed among us in this. This is the, the proof of a mature love. Grown-up love does this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. So mature love, love matured in your life looks like boldness when you're being judged. Now, judgment can come in a lot of different ways. I think a, a, a good portion of the time what people do is they immediately think judgment from God. But there's more to this than judgment from God. How many know there's judgment from man? How many know there's judgment from the world? How many know there's judgment from yourself? You might be the weightiest gavel. That slams down a verdict of not worthy in your life. I think that we have a tendency to judge ourselves more severely. And really, when you're severely judging yourself, you will severely judge those that are close to you as well. Maybe not those from afar, but those that are close to you will receive that same judgment. Because as that gavel comes down, it doesn't just make impact in your heart, it makes impact in the hearts of those around you. When you're experiencing condemnation and unworthiness and not being good enough, you can give off a vibe, <laughs> if you'll allow the word vibe. Your atmosphere can be filled with the turmoil of your own heart. And God wants to come and speak peace be still to your heart, and He wants to heal your heart. And in healing your heart, He will actually heal the other relationships that are around you that have fallen down into that trap of condemnation. But it starts with you. No one can really forgive you except you. I don't mean that in an overall sense. How I many old God's the one that provides all forgiveness? See, God's pretty much done with how he feels about you. <laughs> the gavel's already went down on your life. You know what the verdict is? Innocent. Because you weren't on trial, the blood of Jesus was on trial, and the blood of Jesus was successful. So a verdict of innocence has come from God. But how many know we can we cannot have the gavel of innocence in our own hands in our own lives. We can have the ga the gavel of judgment and condemnation towards ourselves, and we can be hitting our own hearts with that form of accusation and and causing a condemnation to come into our lives. Now, how do you get free from it? How do you change the gavel out of your own hands? You know, well, that's what this passage is talking about. It's about the maturing of love. The maturing of love. Now, this is not your love for God. This is God's love for you. <clears throat> you maturing in your understanding. Of, let's, read it, let's read this whole passage in context real quick. Love has been matured among us in this, and we have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but mature love drives out fear, because fear involves torment. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love like this because He first loved us. So this whole well, this whole passage that's filled with promises is based upon God's love for you. And so you maturing in the love of God is not you maturing in your love for God. It's in you receiving His love for you. Can I get an amen? Everybody in this room, you can get better at that. I don't care how much you've heard it. I don't care. I've written books about it. I've been preaching it for over 10 years, and I'm still learning it. You know what I'm saying? It's still cleansing me and helping me to love myself. Because a part of the reception of that love is not just you receiving God's love for you, it's you receiving God's love for yourself. So you'll stop condemning yourself and drop that gavel of judgment out of your hands and take up 
the gavel in God's hands, which is a gavel of innocence, a gavel of righteous judgment. The Lord has judged you righteous. Can I get an amen? And as you believe that, as you receive that, as you allow that, that love to, to grow into a place of maturity, then, then the resonance and the, 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 the repercussion, the result of this in your life will be boldness in the day of judgment. So now, rather than cowering when the judge comes, you stand up strong and mighty on the cornerstone of, of Jesus Christ, the rock of your salvation, and you boldly condemn the tongue, tongues of judgment that rise against you in your own heart. And when you do that, then that promise, then the door of that promise opens in your life. What? The rest of that passage in Isaiah. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. For any, if any tongue of judgment rises up against you in condemnation, you condemn it. For this is your heritage as a servant of the Lord. And their, their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. That's how he ends that passage. He said, they're not operating in their righteousness, they're operating in my righteousness. That's why they can condemn the tongues of judgment. That's why they've lost the right to judge and condemn themselves. Because they're not talking about their righteousness, they're talking about mine. So don't bring reproach against my righteousness, judging yourself to be unworthy, because I didn't make you unworthy, I made you worthy, and my blood is so powerful, it's able to make you worthy, to keep you worthy. So you stay in this state of radical receiving. Radical receiving. Say that with me. Radical receiving. I'm talking about when the grace of God abounds in your life so much that you never have a moment where you think that you're unworthy to sit down at the table and to receive what God is giving to you. Y'all tracking me here. A radical receiving. In the abundance of grace, coming boldly to the throne of grace to attain help in time of need. It doesn't define what that help is. That help can be anything. Help with your car. Help with your spouse. Help with your taxes. Help with your friends. Help with your children. Help with your parents. Help with anything. <clears throat> How many know that whatever you have need of, it's in the bosom of your Father? You know, I, one time I, um, I, I, I preached it. <clears throat> this church in northern Ohio, and uh, it's where we do our youth camp and stuff. And when I first connected with this church, I, I met this guy at this conference. Uh, he's, he was actually the mentor of Lucas Miles. And I was at this conference with Lucas, and I was preaching, and, and he preached at the end. And this guy was just so full of love, and he was such a father, and he had such a father's heart. And he gave one of these examples about his grandkids. He said, you know, my grandkids, they're always reaching down into my pockets to find out what I have in there. And if they draw near to me and they reach down in my pocket, they know whatever's in my pocket's theirs. Whether it's money, whether it's candy, whether it's a toy. And so, like, he painted this, this beautiful picture of the heart of God. And God wants his kids to be bold in receiving from him. Now, I'm not talking about this weird, loud, chihuahua boldness. How many of y'all, there's the boldness of a chihuahua and there's the boldness of a lion? How many of a lion isn't loud for the most part? How many of a lion doesn't spend most of his time roaring? How many of the devil's the one that goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour? Well, a, a, a lion's life is characterized by rest. A lion is very confident in his ability. I mean, you know, when you, have a, when you have a level of strength and size, you can be a peaceful person. And, and the lion is king of the jungle and knows it. And so his, his boldness is displayed in rest. God, I'm not talking about God bringing a loud, clanging, brash boldness into your life that's devoid of love. I'm talking about the love of God running its course to you and through you to where you're a walking, living, breathing love. And there's a boldness that comes into your life because fear cannot lay rooted in the heart that knows that it's perfect in love. I'm talking about the eradication of fear and nervousness out of your life. I'm talking about the removal of these things. 
to where you're living, breathing, walking love, and there's a boldness in your life that's displayed in rest, and people are feel comfortable to draw near to you and to come to you for help in their time of need. Can I get an amen? There's no self-righteousness in that place. There's no, um, it's just this beautiful place. And so we get back to just the perfection of that in our lives, and it, it comes back to really just receiving. How many of y'all felt like you've received the love of God today? Amen, I do. And just a reminder of who he is and what he's done. And, um, and we just, we keep getting reminded. We keep allowing it. So I believe this boldness that comes into your life, and I'm closing right here, it's not going to be the product of your own effort or your own works. It's just like, you know how Lily will just boldly drink communion <laughs> and boldly do the things that she does? There's no concept in her mind that she's not loved and accepted. It's not there. That knowledge of, of good and evil has, is not there. She's in a total state of innocent confidence. When she's walking around up here, she's not concerned about what any of you think about her whatsoever. When she's being loud up here and, and there, you guys are trying to do the community, she's like, ah! She's not concerned what anybody thinks about her. Can I get an amen? Because she knows that she's loved and there's no doubt in her mind that, that, that she is loved. So what I'm saying to you is the innocence that's going to arise in your hearts and your lives is going to be the product of you receiving that love and that boldness is going to, it's going to be like a flower that grows on the inside of you as you just stay rooted and grounded in the love of God and allow it to drive out fear. There's going to be a boldness that comes in your life. Um, but that boldness is really important because God needs you to, to take what's yours in the days ahead. Take his provision, take his healing, take his protection. Can I get an amen? We don't got to walk and live like the world does, man. We have a different path of existence. We have a different trajectory. Amen. And um, we want to demonstrate that in the world, not only so that we can enjoy it for ourselves, but also so we can so we can invite other people into it. Amen. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, God. OK, so we're going to end that portion of service. Um, if you need to give an envelope this morning, lift your hand up. We'll get one to you. Tim can finally pass out an envelope. Praise God. Dan's over here. He's been he's his arms been hurt. And he's like, man, Tim's been gone for two months. And I'm just kidding. <laughs> Tim will, Tim will approach you a little softer than Dan. Dan will come stand next to you and wait for you to give. Dan will be like, hey, what's up? <laughs> Tim don't roll like that. Dan, Dan come from old school, man. Just kidding. We can joke around like that, can't we, man? <laughs> oh, man. We go way back. I've known Dan for over 20 years, man. It's pretty cool. Thankful that you're in my life, man. Yeah, I think so. No, no. Well, well, yeah, maybe like nine, probably 98. Probably 98 for me, yeah. How long is that? Golly, wow. It's amazing. I know, especially when I'm only 30. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's crazy. Like, supernatural, Lord. <laughs> I know, I know. It's a sobering reality, isn't it? It's funny. It's amazing. Huh? I don't I don't think so. No, I don't, I don't think I was. I was doing 30 days in the county jail in 98. I wasn't 30 years old. <laughs> yeah. No, math. I'm as old as my wife tells me I am. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> She, oh yeah, infant. Yeah, yeah. Don't get her started. She's got. She could write a book on that concept right there, boy. Couldn't she? She don't cut me no slack, does she? She don't cut. But see, I need someone in my life that don't cut me slack. I mean, I, I really do, and and she cuts me no slack, so it's good. Yeah. She she's merciful to to children and um, old people. Other than that, everybody else is going to have to suck it up and get it together. <laughs> oh, it's great. Everybody's like, am I old? Is that why she's so nice to me? <laughs> Just kidding. All right, got a couple announcements here. Uh, we got our youth camp coming up in July, July 6th. It's going to be awesome. Um, if you got some young people, send them our way. Um, it's it's going to be amazing. We got our Myrtle Beach Conference coming up. That's June 21st through the 24th. I uh, encourage you to come out to that. That's a really good time, and we have a lot of fun with that. 
And then we got our men's prayer breakfast, and that is, um, that's coming up as well. We're going to do it at the end of the month, February 25th. We're going to do it right here at the church, and uh, we're just going to have a table prepared, and we're going to have fellowship, and we're not just having people in our church. We're having people from other churches come and just kind of bringing the men together. When I was in South Dakota, we did a men's prayer breakfast, and it was really cool to speak to just men and to minister to, to specifically to men. And, um, and, you know, there's different things that can be said and different things that can be addressed when, it, when it's just that. And we, you know, I spent time talking about how, you know, this culture is trying to attack our mas- masculinity and how masculinity is not toxic. Masculinity is actually healthy if it's used to protect. And, um, and then also how, you know, God in the days that we're living in, turning the hearts of the fathers back to the children, the hearts of the children back to the fathers. Amen. And, um, and there's a restoration that happens in that. So there's a certain level of responsibility that we have as men, but at the same time, uh, we give out a lot and we don't take in as much. And so it's important to let somebody feed you some bacon and, and let Jesus tell you how much he loves you. Amen? And so that's the plan. And so that's on the 25th and that's 9 a.m. We're looking forward to that. And then also we're going to start our outreaches back up in March 13th. And so we'll be doing outreaches out of the shelter and, uh, you know, just be loving on people and stuff like that. So, you know, we're about to make, make a change in seasons, amen, where we're coming to the end of winter, and uh, spring is on the horizon, and let's hit the ground running, amen. How I many you know God's doing great things in the earth? Praise God. It's good, man. And then, uh, you know, just get over there to Wilmore and check out the outpouring that's happening over there. I've not been yet, but I definitely want to go, and uh, probably go uh, Monday, I would think, is when I'm going to head down there. But uh, so anyway, so great days are ahead, amen. So we can, we can finish all this stuff online. We love you guys. God bless y'all. Thank you for watching. Now we handle snakes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Never handled a snake. I run from snakes. <clears throat> Teresa's out. She's gone. Even, even a joke of snakes, and she's, she's already in her car. Just don't peel out when you hit the parking lot, you know.